because I don't have Dan here. Again, test is tomorrow. The uh, paper will be due next Wednesday. My final exam will be next Friday, and that will be that. Please try to hold back your tears. <laughs> What we've been talking about the last time was uh, I the activities of the Reconstruction government in Arkansas. Among those activities was uh, inordinate spending that on a railroad and levee construction. The state did introduce a, a ton of bonds uh, to try to uh, pay for all this. Now, understand how a bond works. Essentially, it's an IOU. As the government uh, puts up these bonds, people buy them. Essentially, if you're, doing it, you're putting up the buying a bond is you're giving that entity money, and the IOU is a promise that they'll pay you back with interest. For example, you buy a fifty-dollar treasury bond at the bank. Basically, you're giving fifty dollars to the government, and they're saying, "I promise you, at the end, we'll give you a hundred dollars back." The problem was, though, the state had absolutely no credit, no means of paying back all these bonds. So the state is getting in money, but uh, they have no means of giving it back out. So now the state is being stuck with a deeper and deeper mountain of debt. This can be known as the Holford bonds. came known as after the war, after the reconstruction. Every county across the state is supposed to pay for it uh, and put up money for taxes, for uh, construction of railroads, bonds being sold uh, left and right. The state has a very poor credit rate. Essentially, today, it would be the equivalent of a junk bond. A bankrupt state can pay for billions of dollars worth of improvements. Ultimately, $9.9 million worth of bonds were appropriated for a construction of railroads. And the problem was that uh, a lot of members of the state legislature served on the boards of local railroad companies. The situation was not good. Essentially, they're making the state borrow money to pay themselves. And we would call today corruption, they call those days so business as usual. So as a result, nearly $10 million in bonds being sold, the state has no way of paying that back. Before long, investors realized it. And so the values of these bonds collapsed. 1871, these bonds are only worth about 40 cents on the dollar. And they dropped 60%. Instead of buying this bond to pay $100 back, you might be looking to get 40. State started defaulting. Uh, all companies uh, that were receiving state assistance through these bonds, that's their cheap land, loans, and grants. Uh, these companies defaulted to the state government. There's so many of them that being run so poorly that they go bankrupt too. At least the state holding the bag, making the state's problems even worse. I mean, so bad by the 1880s, the state essentially is going to be bankrupt again because of these Holford bonds. It's going to be a huge issue for years of the 
when the Democrats retake control of the state after the reconstruction, legislators are incensed by these holder bonds that they're left with such a huge debt. They, uh, there's a serious debate over whether the state should just ignore them. The idea was that these uh, bonds were illegally procured, that uh, there was an illegitimate government to just ignore the bonds. Well, some uh, business leaders in the state said that, you know, like it or not, we have this debt. If we don't pay it back, our credit rates can go to the toilet. Drag the state down with it. Well, they're right, but the bonds were ignored anyway, and the state went bankrupt again. As pressure mounted against Republicans um, that still disfranchised the Confederate veterans, a lot of infighting began to erupt within the Republican Party. And like I said, the former Confederate veterans, they are boycotting you know, Republican-owned businesses. Uh, anyone who's supposed to be sympathetic to or is a member of the uh, Reconstruction government doing everything they can to undermine this government, to not their violence, just by political means, just by uh, civil disobedience. <coughs> and uh, as a result, more and more Republicans are trying to find uh, jobs, a little bit of extra money from the state. And it's through a patronage, we're hoping that uh, a lot of people are hoping that through patronage, so they'll be able to uh, pay their bills. And so uh, one faction of Lieutenant Governor James Johnson in leading a uh, charge against the governor of uh, Hal Clayton And Johnson is an organizer can be known as the liberal faction. Later on, referred to as the liberal party. And essentially, the charge against the Clayton is uh, extravagance and corruption. Really, Johnson is any better. Johnson and the, and the liberal faction aren't better than anybody else. I guess this point leaves in mind of liberal at this time and conservative this time mean very different things. So, you have the conservative Democrats and the liberal Republicans. Uh, so the issues are extremely different. The meaning of liberal and conservative are very different from what they mean today. So kind of take this the grain of salt. But uh, across the country, the Republican Party is splitting over the issue of corruption in state governments. Many supporters of status quo saying that to the victor go the spoils. Uh, others saying that uh, the liberal and the liberal Republicans saying that uh, uh, this corruption is unacceptable. So in 1869, Johnson charges uh, Clayton with the extravagance, uh, mismanagement, corruption, and abuse of power. But mainly it's coming an issue of personal opposition rather than anything ideological. So the Liberal Party ideologically is not much more different than the regular Republican Party. Essentially, Johnson thinks he should, and his supporters think they should be in charge. Uh, Clayton, his board of saying they should be in charge. Well, in 1871, there are enough conservatives back in the legislature that are working with this liberal faction that now effectively have a control of the state legislature. In fact, kind of a crude working majority. As 
this point, there's an opening in the uh, for you as senator. And Governor Clayton decides uh, he's going to run for the U.S. Senate. Remember, it's not until 1913 that uh, U.S. Senators are going to be elected uh, by call for a vote. This time, the election still take place in the state legislature. So he's facing a, uh, he's running for U.S. Senate. Very highly powered political climate to where uh, members or one-time members of his party are out to get him. And the legislature is controlled by the opponents. What do you think is going to happen to him? Lose. Yeah, you would think that actually. He ended up winning. Essentially, they decided they just want to get the guy out of Arkansas. So they're going to send him to the U.S. Senate. <laughs> Obviously, when we want to get rid of people, we send them to uh, Washington. Uh, now, this is where it starts getting really kind of weird. He becomes a U.S. Senator, serves for a term, retires quietly back to Arkansas. Uh, the governor resigns, about the con according to the state constitution, particularly the 1868 constitution, the lieutenant governor will become governor. But Clayton hates uh, got Lieutenant Governor Johnson. He did everything he can to avoid getting him power. So, uh, Clayton does not turn power over to Johnson. This gets kind of complicated. He basically finds as many lawyers as he can, tells them that, what, that he uh, doesn't have to turn over a power to uh, Johnson. <coughs> so what happens is, he refuses basically to step down as governor and turn over power to Johnson. So Clayton's uh, uh, allies in the, in, the, in the legislature decide they're going to try to get rid of Johnson. So they're going to try to impeach him, trump up some kind of charges, find something, anything on him to get Johnson out of the way. So that way uh, Clayton can step down as the governor and <coughs> someone else will step in. The thing was, though, they had nothing on Johnson. Charges failed. Uh, so the coalition of Democrats and liberal Republicans then tried to impeach Clayton. Clayton still had enough allies that he was able to derail the uh, impeachment proceedings in the Senate. So they're basically trying to get rid of each other for impeachment. Uh, And now, the two are at an impasse. Johnson wants a Johnson wants a Clayton's a hands out of the Republican Party. So Clayton wants Johnson out of the way out of the Republican Party. Basically, trying to kick each other out. They tried impeaching each other, didn't work because they didn't have anything on each other. I didn't have enough support to get rid of one or the other. So essentially, it seemed like all that uh, Johnson had to do was just wait out how Clayton that he would become governor. That's what gets even stranger. Clayton persuades the Secretary of State to resign. The Secretary of State, all their job basically is uh, today is to. Uh, Oversee elections uh, and uh, uh, file a corporation, an uh, article of corporation with the state. Basically, not a lot to do, but basically, the state record keeper. It's a modestly paying position. But uh, Clayton persuades Secretary of State to step down and persuade Johnson to step down as lieutenant governor and become secretary of state. And Johnson accepts. How or why, no one ever said. I've had pictures of Johnson in a compromising position. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> 
like taking a pay pay or something. I mean, it doesn't it is. It's got pay, it's got prestige. And governor is very nice at pay job. I mean, it's not a lot. Uh, he, up until the 1970s, like a few thousand a year. Uh, that you get to get to stay in the nicest house in Little Rock. Free room and board can't be that. I think that about Arkansas legislature is they've never been intimidated by it. Um, I've already pictures of them. I know a guy used to be a lobbyist. He told me stories that make him physically sick. Well, Johnson is now Secretary of State, the once a future governor. Um, but now there's an opening for lieutenant governor. And the governor. So uh, the next one in line in the portal supporter succession is the president of the Senate, Ozer Haddon. Essentially, he's the head of the Senate, and he becomes governor. And he'd serve out the remainder of Clayton's term. Probably on table one of the most bizarre of term events in Arkansas political history. That uh, a faction so incensed, so hating the governor, that they sent him to the U.S. Senate, and, the lieutenant, and uh, his chief opponent steps down and becomes Secretary of State. I'm still trying to figure that out. Now, anybody understand what has happened there? Can they explain it to me? So now, uh, Hadley's now governor. That's a fairly quiet term. comes along, or I can say it did come along, and it's an election year. Hadley is not running for governor. Uh, but the uh, civil war sorts in the Republican Party still continue. Now, uh, two candidates end up rising to a uh, have these different factions. One is uh, Elijah Brooks. As uh, the article says here, a third full paragraph of factionalism within the Republican Party throughout the 1868 election, such uh, as a hotly contested uh, inter party governor's race in 1872. This is uh, culminated in the first back to war of 1874. 
practically what the end state civil war of like 200 people did. So their infrastructure was an extraordinarily violent period in Arkansas. That was the, with the Klan and the lynchings with the militia war, but also the Brooks Baxter war. The politics in Arkansas this time period, uh, they played for keeps. Now here's that what happens here. Joseph Brooks is a former Methodist preacher, originally from Ohio, wandered into Arkansas through Missouri. And he's headed the state election commission. Uh, uh, during the 1868 election. And so what he did was uh, he manipulated the election returns to ensure the election of Clayton as governor for the passage of the new state constitution. Basically, the state election commissioner, his job was to stuff the ballot boxes. And of course, a Methodist minister would never do anything like that. Hmm. So he had no that, been honest. Not a raised Methodist, I would make little comments like that. Uh, essentially, a state election commissioner, you control the ballot boxes, so uh, you can allow the, you can stuff the ballot box yourself, or you can allow it to be stuffed and the uh, pipe will go on your way. I'd say no proof that Brooks ever did anything untoward, but uh, he allowed the untoward to happen. There are a couple of uh, unusual results in some counties. Remember, the uh, ballot fraud can only be practiced by people who control access to the ballot box. In this case, it was the State Republican Army. By way, of the, by way of the United States Army. But, it's being practiced both ways. Union troops control voter registration of keeping uh, qualified federal veterans from voting. And the Ku Klux Klan in 1868 was keeping qualified African Americans from voting also. Essentially, it's whoever could intimi uh, most intimidate uh, the other side. Now, Brooks uh, in charge of the State Election Commission. Essentially, he's paying very close attention to a fraud that went against the Republicans. Ignoring fraud that went for Republicans. Now, the, new, the 1868 Constitution greatly increased the powers of the government, which meant that as long as Republicans could control the governorship, they could control the state. That politics afterward would be a reaction against uh, Reconstruction and uh, the 1868 Constitution. Back for years afterward, uh, there are notorious stories of a ballot box stuffing all across Arkansas. Uh, Dale Bumper's autobiography wrote about, uh, about his run in the 1970 primary about uh, in some counties he had huge leads on election night, but over the next several days, their county ballot boxes, somehow magically, hundreds of new votes were being found for his opponents as they counted the cemetery for. But as they realized, uh, apparently, uh, as his opponents began realizing they couldn't uh, beat him, that he had legitimately won the election, the numbers go back to the original totals. Those hundreds of extra votes just disappeared. Now, 1868, uh, this article here kind of describes the election results were like Christmas for the Republicans. Everyone got something, except for Brooks himself. Essentially, he was locked out of any kind of prestigious position, appointment, or anything else. Clayton's colonies went to Washington as senators, representatives, received state cabinet posts and legislative seats, appointments as tax collectors and judges, basically the power to appoint to local, uh, local officials. Brooks, who had largely responsible for it all, got nothing. 
He at least expected he might be able to get a congressional seat out of this. No do it. Well, Brooks nursed his resentment for three years. I hated Clayton. I uh, hate Clayton and his faction. Then formed a splinter party in May 1872 and announced his candidacy for the governor in that year's election. This century was the Liberal Party. Uh, but for Brooks, it was nicknamed uh, the Brindle Tables. Brindle Tables. Supposedly because it was uh, because of Brooks and Bell allowed the Brindle Tales bull. Now, the Brindle Tale platform called for what uh, called for universal suffrage, universal amnesty, and honest men in office. Which basically meant to more voting rights for African Americans, letting it, ensuring that African American men have the right to vote, storing full voting privileges to former Confederates, and honest men in office, of course, Joseph Brooks. Now, what's happening this time across the South is something called the fusion is taking place. Fusion of tickets. As the Democrats are allying with the Republican dissidents, the liberal, the liberal Republican faction, to try to uh, oust the uh, radical Republicans from office. They thought they had a common enemy, so they would try to unite their forces, the like Confederate veterans with the uh, African Americans, to try to dislodge the radicals. As to they might be able to appeal to economic issues and political issues. But fusion does not work, it fails miserably across the South. Probably because of this fusion activity trying to uh, put together two factions that have been uh, completely at odds with each other, completely hostile to each other, basically depressed the turnout. No, uh, since we know that very few people want to vote for these fusion tickets. Essentially, it's like trying to run a, a ticket with uh, Ralph Nader and Pat Roberts on the same ticket. So you just end up canceling each other out. Now, a crucial plank was the second, restoring full voting rights to the former Confederates. This is a plea for Democrats. The Liberal uh, Party knows they can't win without the Democrats. So uh, Brooks and his people are trying to uh, piece together support. They're having some difficulty doing it. But uh, the other faction, led by Elijah Baxter, came in as the minstrel faction. Minstrels. Uh, apparently because Baxter was a musician of some sorts. That. Uh, So much opposition to him that uh, as the election progressed, uh, Brooks' support is even finding more and more support. Now, in the meantime, uh, those are Hadley's governor. Uh, and uh, Clayton. Apparently, is a supporting Baxter in his bid for governor. Now, Baxter has been a circuit judge and a former dry goods merchant uh, from Batesville. He was quietly pushing back and was quietly pushing in Baxter for uh, to win. Now, as election day approached, it was quite clear it was going to come a race of who could stuff the ballot box the most. Very open, unapologetic fraud was happening on both sides. Both uh, registered the dead, voted repeatedly, intimidated opposition voters at gunpoint, burned ballots, and fabricated ballots at will. Makes made democracy a little more than just a joke. So it basically had the most uh, force, the most firepower, was going to win. 
same registering the dead, they just simply have wrote the names of the dead on the voter registrar voter registration rolls, and somehow magically they ended up voting. Um, this time the party still put up their own ballot, so you have a say Elijah Baxter for a governor and the stuff that and the and have precinct workers hold, uh, handing out these ballots uh, at the uh, polling sites, basically trying to write down to put that vote in there and got cast. Well, they might be handing two or three to each, just shove them in there at the same time. That two or three uh, voters. And somehow somebody wandered across the county line to the next precinct and uh, voting again. To get the turn. Um, they have many elections across the country. Call them, say vote early and vote often. And of course, uh, some counties uh, where one faction or the other controlled uh, the ballot box, they'd be going through the ballot boxes later, seeing, uh, well, let's see, we got a, a Baxter vote for Brooks County, bought up, throw in the trash, burn it. I'd say, uh, you know, I really can't make this out here. Uh, it, said, it looks like a Baxter, but it could very easily be Brooks. So they say, well, we'll just scratch out uh, Baxter right in Brooks. Or look, we've got a hanging chat here. won this election, heaven only knows. So we could dig for years trying to figure all this out to, and never get it straight. Uh, say the records uh, were essentially destroyed. Half a dozen different reports on the election returns in different counties. Everyone suspects in one county, but what the actual returns came and showed was something completely different. Like I said, it comes to matter just who had the most firepower was the one that's going to become governor. Who had the most ability to intimidate and manipulate returns, those were the ones who were going to win. Say so it didn't matter if you voted in the 1872 election because I vote I wouldn't count or it'd be counted several times. It didn't matter if you didn't show up to vote because somehow magically you showed up at the polling place. Your name's right there on the poll on the name's right there on the voter sheet. Now this author's article suggests that Brooks really had won the election. But the official returns show that uh, Baxter got 41,808 votes, or 51.8% of the vote. Uh, Brooks got 38,909, and 48.2%. So the fusion between the uh, Democrats and liberal Republicans fails. Baxter and his faction Republicans apparently was able to manipulate the results and win.
held it. Uh, so uh, Elijah Baxter becomes governor. Even though they probably lost the election. Or did he? So I'm not sure. The whole thing reeked to high heaven. Everyone in the state knew it. The Baxter Lois, they want the patronage, they want jobs. And it's their man and uh, their meal ticket of Elijah Baxter. Of course, if the Brooks forces came out ahead, it would have been the exact same thing. Baxter was sworn in on January 6, 1873, by Chief Justice John McClure, who also happened to be a minstrel. Brooks took his case to court, but the uh, circuit judge was named John Wycock. Basically, he took his petition, buried it under a stack of files, uh, never to be seen again. Basically, he just brought it in and ignored it. Wycock, of course, being a minstrel. A Baxter, uh, in spite of the election, Pretty be reasonably honest to the governor. There was a, no major charges of misappropriation or of fraud. He appointed a very able men, both Democrat and Republican, to a state and local posts. He organized the state militia in a popular fashion. It's basically a troops of elect their own officers as they had, as they had in, the, in the Civil War. Uh, he pushed through the legislature a proposal to amend the Constitution to soften voting sanctions against ex Confederates, that is, allowing more of not more Confederates to vote. So essentially doing what uh, a lot of what Brooks had proposed, one major difference. Uh, instead of uh, pushing for Brooks in office, it's Baxter pushing for himself. Now, later that year, 1873, um, 33 late state legislatures, re legislators resigned from office to accept higher paying state jobs in Baxter's administration. As long as Baxter now is in the, as governor, he can appoint these jobs and be paying a lot more than a state legislator. These legislators being the pinch from the boycotts of their businesses, uh, they're, that they're basically accepting these positions out of desperation. 33 legislators jumping and taking these offices. But they all realize that uh, these new voting provisions, the Confederates were coming out in droves to vote. Once it took effect, would return the Democrats to political power in the state. So they're taking these uh, lucrative uh, state jobs while they still can. Draws the next election, Republican Party voted out. They're going to try to basically milk the system more than they can while it comes uh, time still good. Special elections held that fall were placed in the legislature. The Democrats won all 33 seats. So the next legislative session, the Democrats, again, would be the majority of the legislature. Now, they all know that the, uh, public, that the Democrats would have Call a constitutional convention to rewrite the 1868 Constitution. And probably rewrite the state charter and do all the privileges and advantages that uh, the Republicans had uh, uh, piled up for themselves. So now, desperate to uh, keep these new positions, these, uh, a lot of these newly appointed officers turn on Baxter. They do everything they can to make sure that uh, uh, the Confederates stay out of power. They could do so basically by it, well, eating their own. Now all this, all this comes back to one important principle. You don't know how anybody is until there's money involved. They will turn around and stab you in the back for dying. That's the way some people are. They just 
they just get a whiff of money, they start doing all sorts of weird things that you never expect they would do. <laughs> we have a knowing laugh here. So uh, that's exactly what starts happening here, is uh, wanting to protect their own financial interests, they turn on their benefactor. Now, the only way the Republicans could keep their hold on state, the state to be able to regain their control of the governorship and use that power in the office to pressure the election officials and disallow the results of that special legislative election. Makes them have to find a way to throw out these uh, special elected legislative terms. Back to what do such a thing. I mean, there have been enough uh, incriminations of the 1872 election that even if he wanted to, he couldn't possibly get away with uh, throwing out all these le uh, special. Uh, they do the special election returns. Baxter's not going to play along, so uh, these officials decide the only way to do that is to get rid of uh, Baxter's governor. Now, they can impeach him, but they don't have the numbers. Essentially, that comes down to basically a coup d'etat. They essentially have to throw him out of office somehow. Well, meanwhile, old Brooks is still sitting out there. He sees this infighting within the Baxter's people. And besides, yeah, he'll help lead the charge to get Baxter out of office, whatever it takes. Brooks still thinks that with all the fraud that he should be the rightful governor. Well, he may well have been, but uh, no one's really sure. Thus now the uh, Brooks Baxter contest of 1872 is now reopened. Months after the election is declared official, the reopening the case and taking a new look at it. Many minstrels are uh, now uh, supporting uh, Brooks. But seeing what all is happening here, the attempt to try to throw out a sitting governor isn't sitting well with a lot of Brooks' supporters, most of them Democrats. They start backing away from Brooks and actually start wandering toward Baxter. Essentially, their, uh, their supporters now all switching sides. What's happening here is the leadership of these factions is completely ignoring uh, the interests of their supporters. The reason why they became the leaders of these factions in the first place. But now they see that their opponents, the leader of the other factions, are now representing their interests very high stakes interests, and so now they're going out, now they're switching sides. So it gets steadily and steadily more confusing. I'd say uh, the brutal tales now with Brooks, I'd say uh, now with Baxter, they're hoping to. Uh, want to keep the special legislator terms in place which will return the Democrats to power. And one thing that is not, not comfortable with the idea of a coup d'etat against the city governor. Brooks and the minstrels, they're trying to keep the Republicans in power. They're trying to keep uh, those of uh, uh, Brooks supporters are trying to, uh, the minstrels are now trying to make sure that they keep their special privileged position. That means turning their first born enemy, Joseph Brooks, for support. And Brooks wants to play along. So here's how it all uh, breaks down. <clears throat> April 15, 1874. At 11 a.m., Circuit Judge uh, Whitehawk, he was a minstrel, originally supported Baxter, now with uh, Brooks, suddenly finds this petition from a uh, that Brooks had filed a protest in the 1872 election. If had any kind of notice that Baxter, his lawyers, uh, uh, ruled that Brooks was the legal governor of Arkansas. They found there was enough fraud that he threw out the 1872 election returns, the official returns, and declared Brooks to be governor. Chief Justice McClure, a minstrel, again, one who swore in the uh, Baxter in 1873 now swears in Brooks as governor. And 
And now, uh, Brooks, now backed by General R.F. Patterson, his former commander of the state militia, his former armed men, go down, the go down to the state capitol where Baxter's office is, that's the old state house at Markham Center, and told him that now Brooks is now governor and he must now surrender his office. Well, Baxter replied that uh, he would, quote, uh, neither resign nor surrender the office unless compelled by force. And thus force was applied. Catterson and a few of his men literally pick up Baxter, drag him out of the office, and throw him out in the street. At the same time, a second armed party supported by Brook, uh, supporting Brooks sees the state bunch of arsenal at the state capitol. They have weapons, control the state capitol complex. It seems like uh, the uh, coup is taking place uh, without a hitch. Essentially, what we're looking at now is third world politics. Uh, whenever a coup happens, seize control of the, uh, of the military, seize control of the all government offices and try to lock down your opposition so they can't respond, at least keep quiet long enough for you to consolidate power. This is why coups, whenever they happen, are usually on Friday afternoon. Everything's kind of everything's kind of slowing down for the day. No one's really paying much attention, so uh, the opposition faction, the army gets together, they seize control of the communication sites, telegraph lines, telephone, uh, radio, television, seize control of all major strategic points, Converge on the on the capital, seize the dictator of life, and replace him with a new dictator for life. And thus your coup, coup is complete. Sometimes that dictator is ex executed. Sometimes he's thrown thrown a plane, kicked out of the country. Sometimes simply placed under house arrest for a number of months. Well, uh, Brooks's supporters did two of the three. They control communications, they control the army and the cat and the government, but <coughs> did not have control of Baxter and his faction. In mid afternoon, while 300 armed men occupied the state capitol, three of the five state Supreme Court justices wired President Grant that Brooks was legally the government. What this was was simply a correction of the 1872 election results. They got rid of Baxter and put in what they felt was the who they felt was the rightful government. This is all legal because the judge said it was legal, and uh, nothing wrong is going on in Arkansas. Brooks himself telegraphed Grant requesting support and the access to weapons of the U.S. arsenal to make sure there be no discrimination against the new state government. On well, the next day, Brooks uh, issued a proclamation declaring himself the governor and commanding people to remain in their homes, warning, quote, I shall resist to suppress the action of all mobs that assemble together in the banner or the call of Elijah Baxter. All such attempts will lead to strife and bloodshed. So, uh, he's saying, remain in your homes, you're governing control, don't worry about anything, don't pay attention to So three days later, hoping to uh, cement the coup, Arkansas's two senators, uh, Powell Plate and Stephen Dorsey, and three of the state's four congressmen, met Grant and the U.S. Attorney General uh, George H. Williams, basically uh, endorsing the support for Brooks' government. Even though Clayton had been uh, a breakfast.